All right, guys, well, it's a fantastic pleasure to uh, uh, be at the ICTP lecturing at one of these schools, as, uh, as always. I, I, apologize, I apologize that due to uh, some difficulties with my scheduling, this is a more truncated visit than I would have uh, uh, liked to uh, have had. But anyway, I'm, I'm still very happy to uh, be here. <clears throat> just, uh, just, just to say uh, one thing, one of, the, one of my favorite things when I uh, lecture at these schools um, uh, are uh, some are extracurricular physics discussions that uh, that that I, I normally enjoy with the uh, with the students. So um, uh, apart from the lectures, and since I'm only here for uh, uh, for the one night tonight, um, I want to say if anyone wants to talk about uh, any other part of physics, um, the LHC 750 GeV particles, cosmology, uh, anything at all. Um, uh, any collection of you who are interested in having late night talks about this, uh, I'll be hanging out the Adriatico lobby at around 10 p.m. And in the past, these discussions start at 10, and they go to 2, 3, 4, depending on the, uh, depending on the um, stamina of the students. So, um, so anyway, no, no, no obligation, but if you want to hang out and uh, discuss uh, other, other parts of physics, uh, um, uh, if nothing to do with these lectures, then we can, we can do that. All right. So, um, but now to the substance of the lecture, uh, lectures, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, the subject of uh, scattering amplitudes in uh, maximally supersymmetric uh, gauge theories and, uh, and a new picture for uh, what these scattering amplitudes are, really a new mathematical question to which the amplitudes are the answer, um, which involves uh, novel ideas in, in math. It makes a connection with some uh, objects and mathematicians have been studying recently and generalizes them in a significant way. And I don't want to spend a long time on the f uh, philosophy behind this, uh, this uh, research program, but just one, one word about it. We have many indications uh, that we have to think of the idea of space-time as being something emergent. Perhaps, I think more and more people are, are saying it, I've believed it for a long time, that we might even have to think about quantum mechanics as somehow an emergent concept from uh, more primitive ingredients. I think there's actually very good evidence, uh, or circumstantial, weak, but, but uh, good enough to get excited about uh, evidence that, in fact, space-time and quantum mechanics will emerge joined at the hip, sort of hand-in-hand uh, -hand from, from more primitive principles. Um, and if something like that, and we have lots of reasons to think things like that uh, should be true, ultimately having to do with uh, well-known difficulties with thinking about uh, gravity and uh, especially cosmology um, uh, in, in, in the usual, uh, in the, in the usual uh, uh, quantum field theory framework. But uh, we're going to, we're descending way back down to Earth from those uh, lofty heights and thinking about something as concrete and basic as ordinary physical scattering processes, partially because if it's true that there is such a sort of radical reformulation of what normal physics is, where space-time and quantum mechanics are emergent ideas, it's very unlikely that that's going to uh, leave the rest of physics completely untouched. Uh, uh, on the other hand, we know that these things work. We know the world is described by, uh, by quantum field theory. We know we talk about gluon scattering amplitudes at the LHC, and we think about them in the standard way, uh, using local evolution in spacetime as embodied in Feynman diagrams. Um, but if it's really true that there's some way of, uh, some different way of thinking about the physics, then it stands to reason that there should be some different way of even thinking about that physics, standard physics, where the space-time and the quantum mechanics are not playing a starring role, but other concepts play a more starring role. Now, in this case, we're not changing anything. We're not deforming anything. So it's really a matter of reformulation, trying to find a different way of talking about this very standard physics, where these ideas that we rely so heavily on aren't relied on heavily, and we see them come out as derivatives from uh, other things. Um, Already, it's a challenge to figure out how to do that for completely standard uh, quantum field theories. We're nowhere near being able to do that. We're starting with these toy models of uh, planar n equals four super Yang mills uh, in order to get started. But the long-term hope is that uh, by practicing and learning how this magic can work, even in standard physics, it might give us a picture for how to deform away from these ideas in the situations ultimately, the much fancier situations involving gravity and especially cosmology, where we suspect that, that we might actually have to lose these ideas uh, altogether. All right, so um, now that's a, that's a very lofty, highfalutin set of motivations for trying to think of a new way of uh, uh, formulating the problem of uh, 
uh, really any observable in a quantum field theory, but scattering amplitudes are a great observable to begin with because they're genuinely Lorentzian. They're first, they're the things we measure in experiments almost all the time in particle physics. And secondly, uh, while the vast majority of our understanding of quantum field theory is really Euclidean, scattering amplitudes force you to ask Lorentzian questions where time matters. Okay? So, so things go in from the past, they come out in the future, so they're essentially uh, Lorentzian questions. You can't get away from thinking about time because that's hardwired into the question uh, you're asking. And, um, and of course, another indication that there's uh, uh, something like this going on is uh, the famous fact that when you calculate scattering amplitudes using Feynman diagrams, uh, you get an explosion of complexity beyond the very simplest processes. Already two gluons to three gluons, two to two we put on problem sets in graduate school, but two to three gluons is hopelessly complicated. If you open up Peskin and Schroeder, you copy out the Feynman rules, you get you know, 50 pages of completely impenetrable algebra. Um, and yet the final answers are shockingly simple. People discovered, in fact, exactly 30 years ago today, <laughs> Uh, there's a, I just came from a conference at Fermilab that was celebrating the 30th anniversary of the discovery of this incredible formula by Steve Park and Tom Taylor, the, the Park-Taylor amplitude, which is an example of one of these things where hundreds of pages of algebra collapsed to a single, beautiful, simple uh, expression, which back then wasn't clear it was a tip of an iceberg, but today we know it's, it is a tip of a very big iceberg, that uh, there is a horrendous complexity in the standard way of thinking about uh, scattering amplitudes that conceals lots of marvelous simplicity, structure, hidden symmetries, and, uh, and underneath all of it, uh, as I said right at the beginning, some powerful and deep mathematical structures that are slowly being, uh, uh, that are gradually being uh, unveiled. And the story of the amplitohedron is one aspect uh, of these uh, developments. But I'm focusing on it here because um, in the, in, at least in, a, in, in this toy theory of planar n equals four super Yang mills, it's complete. It's complete in the sense that I can, uh, when we'll get to it tomorrow, we'll just start from fresh, completely forgetting about physics. We'll define some geometric object. We'll define a certain dictionary associated with the geometric object. And then studying it, we'll discover that it has all the properties to correspond to scattering amplitudes for gluons in spacetime. The fact that it's local and unitary will be an output from the, from the geometry. It's not at all something, uh, it's not really geometry. It's, it's an algebra geometry, essentially combinatorics underneath all of it. Um, but those properties, the physical properties of locality and unitarity will be outputs and not inputs. And at least in this theory, we can go all the way and see a complete framework where all those things come out. Of course, a very big challenge to uh, generalize away from it. All right, so that's what I want to uh, tell you about. So, uh, but now, this is a large subject. Um, it's uh, still developing fairly rapidly. Um, it's not clear that we're at, the, we're at the bottom of it, that we know the, the, the best ways of thinking about it yet. And um, so I'm not really going to be able to uh, explain all of it to you in the span of three hours. Uh, what I hope to be able to do in three hours, though, is do two things. First, to completely define the terms of the objects we're talking about, because we're just gonna, today we're going to spend some time talking about kinematics, just the, uh, how we think about the variables that label scattering amplitudes in the best, cleanest possible way. And tomorrow I will uh, spend enough time to tell you how to think about the very simple geometry involved. And the, 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 by the way, the, the, the mathematical ideas involved are extraordinarily simple. They're not fancy, they're not complicated. If you do, if you, do you know, other parts of a string theory, it's, it's uh, uh, these aren't sort of fancy kalabi yaws and K3s and all these uh, fancy schmancy things. It's just simple projective space. You just ask questions about configurations of points and planes and lines and, um, uh, it's, it's very slightly unfamiliar, but it's extraordinarily simple. And so what I want to do tomorrow is uh, tell you how to think about this geometry from the ground up in a very simple way, and at least completely finish describing and defining what the object is, and sketch how we start seeing some of the uh, physics emerge from it. Okay. So, so let's start uh, today with the discussion of the kinematics. And let me first remind you of the normal way that you think about scattering amplitudes in textbooks. Uh, let's say we have a bunch of uh, uh, particles with spin one. Let's say a bunch of gluons. Then we have a bunch of momenta, P1, P2, up to Pn. We conventionally uh, use crossing symmetry to imagine they're all outgoing or all ingoing. So the sum of the momenta is zero. 
So A is always going to, in these lectures, is always going to be an index that labels the number of particles. Okay, and we have polarization vectors. In the normal way of thinking about things, we have polarization vectors associated with all of these particles. So what you actually compute, let's say using Feynman diagrams, is some Lorentz tensor, m mu1 up to mu n, uh, which depends on the momenta p1 through pn. But that's not the physical amplitude, right? The, uh, uh, the physical particles are labeled by their helicities. So, uh, so in order to get the actual physical scattering amplitudes for any given helicity, so the helicities are h1, h2, we're working in, in four dimensions, uh, we contract with some polarization vectors, epsilon mu1 h1 up to epsilon mu1 hn. And so this is the actual amplitude. The actual amplitude is not this Lorentz tensor. The actual amplitude is an object that has a mixed transformation property. When you do a Lorentz transformation on the momenta, you get a little group transformation on the helicities. Okay, so if you remember what the little group is, if you have a particle, a massless particle moving in a given direction, there are those Lorentz transformations that don't change the direction in which the, the particle is moving, they don't change the momentum, but they give you a rotation around the direction of the momentum. Okay, so that's uh, those particular Lorentz transformations that leave the, no, the null momentum fixed, but do a rotation around it, are known as the little group transformations. And when you do a Lorentz transformation on the momenta, you have to pick up a little group transformation, a rephasing, under the uh, under the helicities. So, so the actual amplitude is, uh, 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 has this property. So this is, if I do a Lorentz transformation here of H1 through Hn, I have to pick up e to the i. There's some phase that depends on lambda and p on m of H1, Hn, p1 to pn, okay? So, when we use Feynman diagrams, we're pretending that there is this object called the polarization vector, which is like a bifundamental between the Lorentz group and the little group. Okay, so when you do a Lorentz transformation, it soaks up the Lorentz properties and it picks up a rephasing under the uh, little group. And all of that's perfectly fine if we're talking about massive particles. That's perfectly fine and good. But if we have massless particles, um, it is not as good because these polarization vectors don't actually exist. There is no such thing as a polarization vector for a positive helicity photon. Well, you say, what are you talking about? The, I know what it, what it is. Here it is. If the momentum is E, 0, 0, E, then a polarization vector plus or minus is like 1 over root 2, 0, 1, plus or minus I, 0, something like that, right? So you've seen all seen polarization vectors like this. So what do I mean when I say there is no the polarization vector? Well, what I mean is, is the following. We can just see it from counting degrees of freedom. Epsilon has four components, right? Epsilon 0, 1, 2, 3, but there's only two helicities. So there's too many degrees of freedom in epsilon. How can we go from four to two? Well, first we can say that epsilon mu p mu is zero. That knocks you down from four to three. And if you had a massive particle, that would be correct. That would be the correct number of degrees of freedom for a massive particle. But it's not enough for a massless particle. There's only two degrees of freedom for a massless particle. And so we're stuck. There is no Lorentz invariant way of describing, uh, a, uh, of giving, of specifying a polarization vector for the two helicities of a massless particle. This is the key difference between massless and massive, and what forces us to introduce gauge redundancies in our description of the physics. What we have to do instead is declare that epsilon mu and epsilon mu plus anything times p mu are equivalent physical states, okay? And if you go back to position space, in position space, this is like a mu and a mu plus d mu something, okay? So we see that the need for a gauge redundancy in order to, to describe the physical degrees of freedom of the uh, massless spin one particle. Now, how do we see it here? Uh, the problem is that if you take this uh, if you take this uh, polarization vector, and I now, a boost, I now do a boost in the direction, in the z direction, I do a rotation, and then a boost back, okay? So that I, I take the, uh, uh, so I take the p back to itself. Then if you do that under that sequence of Lorentz transformations, you'll find that epsilon will not come back to this form that only has zeros uh, in, the, in, the, in the zero and the z direction. It'll have something non-zero in the zero and the uh, z directions. 
OK? I urge you to do that to exercise, although it's predetermined that it had to be, because there simply isn't a Lorentz invariant way of saying that those zeros are zero. And even if you declare they're zero in one Lorentz frame, if you do enough boosts, you'll come back to a situation where they're not zero in another frame. So that just very clearly shows you that there's no Lorentz invariant way of assigning polarization vectors to photons. The only Lorentz invariant thing we can do is assign this whole equivalence class of polarization vectors with photons. And that's why we have to bake in this huge amount of gauge redundancy into our description of the physics when we have scattering from massless particles. Already, that's the case for massless spin one. Even more, we have the uh, diffeomorphism redundancies when we talk about uh, massless spin two. Okay, so our first task then is to figure out, and this, this should be in the beginning of every quantum field theory textbook, um, should be in the beginning of Weinberg's book, but it isn't in the beginning of Weinberg's book yet. Uh, our first task is to figure out what are the variables that amplitudes depend on? Actually, not redundantly, but actually, right? They redundantly depend on polarization vectors and momenta, but what are they really functions of, non-redundantly? And, and that's really going to be our goal in these lectures, to come up in this lecture, is to come up with increasingly good variables to describe, uh, to describe the amplitudes until we get down to the, to the sort of best set of variables on which which most effectively represents the external data and on which the obvious and unobvious symmetries of the problem act as uh, simply as possible. But to begin with, let's talk about spinner helicity variables. So we're going to work in four dimensions. Um, and uh, 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 many of these ideas port to higher dimensions where you have to replace these spinner helicity objects with pure spinners eventually. Um, but it's very simple in, in four dimensions. So uh, imagine that we have, we have our, our four momentum, and we're going to dot it into the Pauli spin matrices, uh, the, the uh, Lorentzian Pauli spin matrices in the usual way, to get this two by two matrix. Maybe I should put it up. OK. So I hope you're familiar with this, uh, this uh, two-component uh, uh, vial spinner notation. Um, <clears throat> and OK. Um, so uh, the uh, point here is that if we, do, uh, if we look at the determinant, so if I call this matrix capital P, it's a two by two matrix, the determinant of this capital P matrix is just P0 squared minus P3 squared minus P1 squared minus P2 squared, which is just P mu, P mu. And so if I do a two by two linear transformation on P goes to L dagger P L, for any old L, for any L, any L with debt L equals one, then if I do that, the debt P, well, P will first of all go to some P prime, but uh, this is the most general Hermitian matrix I can write down, right? So the most general two by two Hermitian matrix I can write down. So P prime will just be some P prime mu, sigma mu. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry, what am I doing? Thank you, P1 plus IP2. Thank you very much. So P goes to some P prime, so let's call this P prime, which is associated with its own four momenta, but the determinant of P is equal to the determinant of P prime, and so P squared is equal to P prime squared, and so P prime is some Lorentz transformation that depends on L on P. Okay? So that's how we can represent, that's the two-dimensional representation of the Lorentz transformations, um, the spinner representation of the uh, 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 Lorentz transformation, the most basic uh, representation out of which you can build all the rest of them. Okay, so, um, but now something extra nice happens when the, uh, when the momentum is null. So when, when P squared equal to zero, the determinant of this P is equal to zero, and that means that this P A A dot, let me write it like this, as a, a two by two matrix, well, it has, it has a zero eigenvalue, 
It has rank one, there are many equivalent ways of saying it, so I can write it as the outer product of some vector and another two-dimensional vector. Okay? Now, just to be very concrete, if you imagine, uh, if you imagine that the momentum is E, zero, zero, E, the particle moving in the Z direction, then our P matrix is, uh, is two E, zero, 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 and one choice for these lambda and lambda tilde would be like root two E zero, and root two E zero, okay? So th these aren't spinners, they're just completely ordinary bosonic, they're ordinary two-dimensional vectors, okay? But you see that something nice has happened because instead of describing a massless particle by saying that it's a constrained object, a four vector whose zero component is constrained to satisfy P zero squared equals the spatial P squared, now I can just give you free objects, lambda and lambda tilde, freely, okay? And then you can build out of them something which is automatically going to correspond to a null vector, to a null momentum. <clears throat> okay? Um, now, how do Lorentz transformations act on this guy? Well, the, if I complexify everything, if I complexify all the momenta, everything, so I talk about the most general setting, then lambda and lambda tilde are independent two spinners, but they're not spinners, they're independent two vectors, let me call them. And the Lorentz group is SL2C cross SL2C, with a different SL2 acting on the A index and on the A dot index, okay? So the SL2 just acting by two by two linear transformations with determinant one. <clears throat> if we're in Minkowski space, <clears throat> Minkowski momenta, then that's the case where those P's are real and the matrix is Hermitian. <clears throat> so that means that lambda tilde A dot is lambda A star, right? So lambda tilde is a complex conjugate of, of uh, lambda, and the Lorentz group is the SL2C, which is the diagonal of the guys in this complex one. Yes? Sorry? Sure, sure, yes. And finally, there is one last signature that's going to be very useful for us. Um, so we have to learn to be relaxed about reality. So this should not be a difficulty for an audience of string theorists. Okay? Um, but here I mean relaxed about reality conditions on the uh, uh, momenta. Um, so, uh, so we can also imagine that we're in two comma two signature. And a two comma two signature, it's easy to see that what this matrix is would be, I'll keep using zero, three, one, and two, but it doesn't, the, we'll see in a second, the distinction is more meaningless. This is how I would write my P matrix, okay? And so you see that if I take the determinant of P, it's just P zero squared minus P three squared minus P one squared plus P two squared. So this has two comma two signature. And this is just the most general, this is just the most general real two by two matrix. And so in two two signature, lambda and lambda tilde are simply independent real uh, two vectors. And the Lorentz group is SL2R cross SL2R. But in general, I'll refer to the Lorentz group as SL2 cross SL2, and then it'll, by context, it'll be clear whether I mean R or C. Again, we shouldn't, we're not gonna be too, uh, we're gonna be relaxed about, about the reality. Until tomorrow when everything is going to be real numbers and even positive real numbers, but uh, uh, anyway. All right, so, so now, now we have a nice set of variables where I don't have to tell you ahead of time, uh, I don't have to describe the four momenta as constrained 
objects. They just hand you lambdas and lambda tildes. OK? Um, now, let me say a little bit more uh, about this. Uh, so there is, so it looks like we said we have four components of the momentum, but it's constrained. So there's really only three components of the momentum. But it still looks like there's four components in lambda and lambda tilde, two in lambda and two in lambda tilde. So what's going on? What's going on is that uh, it's impossible to actually uniquely specify in a lambda and a lambda tilde once you give me a p. There's still a redundancy under lambda goes to t times lambda, and lambda tilde goes to t inverse times lambda tilde. Okay. If you do that, the momentum, of course, goes into itself. And again, if for real momenta, because lambda tilde has got to be the complex conjugate of lambda, t would have to be a phase. Okay. Now, this redundancy is actually a really good thing, because this is the action of the Lorentz group. Sorry, this is the action of the little group. Okay. That's exactly what the little group is. It's something which keeps the momentum fixed, but it gives a rotation around the direction of motion. And that's exactly what this is. So this is what we are looking for. We are looking for well-defined objects that transform under the Lorentz group on one side and under the little group on the other side so that we can build invariants out of them that transform properly under Lorentz and little group transformations. Okay? Polarization vectors are not them, or they only are them redundantly, but these guys are them directly. And in fact, uh, we can now say what an amplitude is. So if you give me a bunch of, just as a representation theory statement, if you give me an amplitude that depends on, an object that depends on a bunch of helicities and on a bunch of spin of helicity variables, then if you take any one of them and you rescale this by TA and that by TA inverse, then this needs to pick up a particular weight for any given particle. It has to pick up a weight TA to the negative 2HA, where H is a helicity, M of lambda A and lambda tilde A. And this defines the helicity of the particle. It even tells you what the helicity is. Okay? So the helicities don't have to be independently specified. The helicities are encoded in the homogeneities that these functions have under this rescaling. OK? So with this, we can now write down an example of a uh, first example of some uh, scattering amplitude. Let's say the scattering amplitude for uh, uh, four gluons. This is one of the celebrated uh, Park-Taylor amplitudes I, I talked about before. So we have an amplitude, let's say, for helicities, uh, particle one is plus, particle two is minus, particle three is plus, and particle four is minus. OK, then I can write down an expression that looks like two, four to the fourth over one, two, two, three, three, four, four, one. Oops, sorry, I have to tell you one more thing. Sorry. And I have momentum conservation, sorry. Uh, I haven't defined those brackets yet, so let me uh, just hold on to that for a second. Um, the last thing uh, we need to do before getting to that is what are the Lorentz invariants? Well, the only... The only invariant tensors I have are epsilon AB and epsilon A dot B dot. So the only Lorentz invariants I can build is I can take two lambdas, for example, lambda 1A, lambda 1B, and I can lambda 2B, and I can contract them with an epsilon. Okay, so this is, so you can call this lambda 1, lambda 2. And sometimes when it's uh, the, these, the A's that are being contracted, this is represented by a, an angle bracket. So one, two. And the other kind that I can have is the epsilon symbol contracting the other guys. So what are more familiar, what are more familiar Lorentz invariants? Like for example, what is P1 dot P2? Well, up to a factor of two that I'm not going to be careful about, p1 dot p2 is just angle, square bracket one, two, times angle bracket one, two. Okay? And that's because p1 is lambda one, lambda tilde. This is lambda one, lambda 
tilde one, lambda two, lambda tilde two. And if I, uh, and if I contract these guys the only way I can, I get one, two, one, two, okay? <clears throat> so um, now, <clears throat> why does it make sense that I have to have an angle in a square bracket? Because whatever the object is, if it's made out of p's, it has to be invariant under this little group scaling, where lambda goes to t lambda, right? Because the p's are invariant. So if we had angle brackets, we have to have square brackets to compensate uh, the weight, right? When I rescale lambda 1 by t, lambda tilde 1 goes by uh, t inverse. Every time you see these objects nakedly not being compensated by square brackets on the other side, it means it carries some helicity weight. So it's telling you something about uh, 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 the spin of the particles involved. So now let's go back to this expression. So it's, a, it's an amplitude. Um, uh, there is a delta function for momentum conservation, as always. But I, I don't have to uh, explain. I want to, have time to explain where this comes from and what, or why it's the, the correct amplitude. At the moment, we're just looking at, at this, uh, just confirming this trivial uh, group theory scaling property that just by staring at this expression, I can see that these are the helicities of the particles. If I rescale particle one, there's two ones downstairs, so I pick up a factor t to the minus two, t1 to the minus two, which corresponds to helicity minus one. Okay? Whereas if I rescale particle two, there's Two, four twos upstairs and two twos downstairs, so I get a T1 to the plus two, and that corresponds to uh, uh, having helicity minus one, okay? So, uh, so just by staring at the expression, um, uh, just its weights tell me, that, uh, tell me what the helicities are. It also means that I can't have a formula like this. This is a meaningless formula, okay? I can't add these two things. This is completely meaningless because this has a different weight under rescaling as that one does. Okay? <clears throat> so we're starting to get there. Now, a little bit more uh, kinematics. Uh, any questions before I go on, actually? Yes? Well, you see, now instead of, so, so let me just summarize it again. Standardly, normally, an amplitude we write as an amplitude that depend on helicities and momenta, right? And if we want to build it with Feynman diagrams, we would even compute it like this with polarization vectors. Right? That's, that's the usual picture. Now we have something else. Now I just have a function of the lambdas and the lambda tildes. I don't even have to tell you the helicities explicitly. The helicities are implicitly contained in what happens to this. It's a function of lambda and lambda tilde with the property that if you rescale It has to have this fixed rescaling, this fixed homogeneity. Okay. Now, what does it mean in terms of Feynman diagrams? I'll leave this as a little exercise for you. Okay. So, let's say uh, uh, you want to see how would you convert. You see, now the, the entire purpose of these lectures is going to be to never have to talk about Feynman diagrams. Okay. But but we don't have to jump all the way. Okay. Uh, it's a very nice exercise to take Feynman diagrams, even for any thing that you're familiar with. You can even do it for scalar QED for this example, okay? Um, uh, and what starts off as polarization vectors and momenta and converts it to these spinner helicity variables, okay? Now, exercise for you is to show that the polarization vector, let's say, for a negative helicity gluon, is the following. An epsilon, now, because it's a vector, I could write in terms of a, a dot. And this epsilon is actually lambda a mu tilde a dot over lambda tilde mu tilde. Now, mu tilde is a completely random two-dimensional vector. You pick any two-dimensional vector that you like. And the claim is that 
if you build this object, lambda mu tilde over lambda tilde mu tilde, that this will correspond to a good polarization vector for a negative helicity gluon. And if you want a positive helicity gluon, it's the other way around. Okay, it's lambda tilde a dot mu a over lambda mu. Let's just take a, a few quick looks at it. You'll see that this has the correct weight in lambda, right? As weight that corresponds to a negative helicity particle here, positive helicity particle there. But you say, what is this horrible, ugly thing, this dependence on mu tilde? It shouldn't depend on mu tilde, but then you remember I told you before, there is no such thing as the polarization vector. Only this equivalence class of polarization vectors makes sense. And so a lovely exercise you can do is to show that if you shift mu tilde by mu tilde plus anything, let's call it rho tilde, exercise is to show that this polarization vector goes into itself plus something times p. Exactly the linearized gauge transformation that we're talking about, okay? And so what will happen if you just take standard Feynman rules for scale, I encourage you to do it for scalar QED. Just calculate some Compton scattering amplitude in scalar QED. It's very simple, okay? Just these two diagrams, okay? But now go in and shove these guys in for the polarization vectors, use spinner helicities, and watch to your amazement as all the dependence on the mu's drops out and you're left with a function just of the spinner helicity variables, okay? So that's how, and that's of course historically also how people didn't jump immediately to abandon the Feynman diagrams. This was the in between, uh, the, the, the halfway place where you could start seeing these other structures uh, emerge. <clears throat> okay, so. All right, but we're going to now take one more step. Um, <clears throat> what, what, what we've done is trivialize the fact by writing each p as lambda lambda tilde, we've made the fact that p squared equals zero manifest. But there's something else which is not manifest, that the sum of the pa is equal to zero, right? That's momentum conservation. Our goal here is to think about the very simplest thing in the world, just the external kinematical data. We want to think of it in the cleanest, simplest possible way. And it's still not perfect because uh, it's, still, it's still constrained. If you want to, I can't just randomly pick out a bunch of, I can't just randomly pick a bunch of lambdas and lambda tildes. They will fail to satisfy that the sum of all of them is equal to zero. Well, let's forget about this for a second, and let's concentrate on this for a moment. And just to give a little bit of physics uh, motivation for what, what we're about to do, we're ultimately going to be interested in gluon scattering amplitudes. And gluon scattering amplitudes have, in addition to the dependence on helicities and momenta, they also depend on color indices. Okay, so those are just the uh, just uh, uh, just indices uh, of the uh, of the gauge group. Okay, so this now depends on lambdas and lambda tildes. <clears throat> but there is a, or even, let me just call it all the momenta. But there is a standard way of representing the dependence on all these color factors in a very simple way. Uh, you can break the color factors into pieces, each one of which depends <clears throat> on on a trace. Okay, so let me let me give let me give uh, let me give an example for four particles. You can have a piece that's trace of TC1, TC2, TC3, TC4. Okay, so that's the dependence on color times some function that depends on one, two, three, and four. Now notice that this trace is cyclically invariant under under rotating the T's. So this function would have to uh, have some cyclic action on it. Uh, as well. <clears throat> um, of course, if, if we have helicities here, 
Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be cyclically invariant, but these pieces are, are cyclically invariant. Then I can have another piece, which is all the different orderings that I could have. T C1, C3, C2, C4, and then this would be some function of 1, 3, 2, and 4, plus and so on. So in general, this is called a color decomposition of a gluon scattering amplitude. Uh, MC1 through CN of the P would be a sum over all permutations uh, up to cyclic of trace TC sigma 1 up to T sigma n of some pieces M sigma 1 through sigma n. Okay, so these are called uh, color ordered or partial well, color ordered amplitudes. And while this might not be such an immediate thing to think about when you're doing, uh, when you're doing uh, Feynman diagram calculations, well, actually it is. Because the way, the way it arises when you do Feynman diagram calculations, everywhere you see an FABC, when you do Feynman diagram calculation, you can uh, replace this up to, by some I's by trace of TA commutator of TB and TC, which is a trace of TA, TB, TC minus trace TB, TA, TC. And it proliferates. Everywhere you have the FABCs, you jam them uh, together in this way. And then uh, you use the simple Casimir identity for TC times TC uh, uh, in order to uh, combine the uh, traces into longer and longer traces. Okay? Um, and at large n, those are the only pieces you have left. And there are one of n corrections that have uh, 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 as well. <clears throat> so uh, so we, we, can, we can always do this. At, at tree level, we can always do this. And we just have single trace pieces in general. Uh, uh, at uh, loop level, we can have uh, multi-trace pieces as well, down by 1 over n. But anyway, we are, uh, we're going to be focused on, uh, on large n theories in the planar limit, and so it's natural to focus on these color ordered pieces. I should also say that, uh, oh, I mean, th this is a, a very important simplification, even just for doing standard Feynman diagram calculations, as one of the things that very early on in the late 1980s was imported, very, very basic feature of perturbative string theory calculations that was imported into field theory amplitude calculations, because the color ordering is forced on you when you do string theory calculations through the chan Payton's factors. That's precisely how string theory tells you how to do the calculations, uh, precisely in this color-ordered way. OK, so, but from here, all we want to take away is that for these color-ordered amplitudes, there's a natural ordering to the momenta. Okay? Without, in general, there's no reason to order the momenta one after the other. But when we strip off the color factors, there's an ordering to the momenta that follows the ordering that we see in the traces. Okay? So now the particles are ordered. And that then makes it natural to do the following thing. So so let's imagine drawing the momenta one after the other, because they're ordered. So here's P1. Here's P2, P3, P4, P5, P6, and so on, OK? Up to some Pn. So I can always draw them in this ordered way. And if this is on a four-dimensional sheet of paper, uh, then the fact that uh, having momentum conservation means that the polygon is closed. So I can trivialize the fact that momentum is conserved just by labeling the momenta instead by the vertices of this polygon. Okay? So in other words, I'm going to write each PA mu as xA plus 1 minus xA. OK? That's fine. So now. If I say this, I've trivialized that momentum is conserved. But now I have to stipulate that the edges are null. I have to stipulate that the edges are null. Okay, So I'm still not done. Or I could say that each edge is null, uh, but I haven't said that, uh, that the sum of null is all equal to, to 0 yet. Okay. 
<clears throat> but this is a very important object in our business. Uh, this, what looks like a polygon with null, uh, with, uh, null, with null edges, uh, in, a, in a suitably correctly defined sense, the scattering amplitudes turn out to be um, dually calculated by the expectation value of the Wilson loop that looks like that, with these null polygonal edges. <clears throat> this is a strange space. This is a space in which coordinates have units of momentum. Okay, so this X space is not the usual space of space time. It's like a momentum space time, okay? <clears throat> but now we're going to spend a little bit of time thinking about this very, very basic geometry of just uh, what do these polygons, how, what's a good way of thinking about these polygons? What's a good way of thinking about these null rays and so on uh, in Minkowski space? Okay, so now we're gonna have a little aside here, is that we want to think about Minkowski geometry and formal symmetry and twister space. So this is an aside and I'm gonna tell you in the next 10 minutes everything you need to know about twister space, at least for the purpose of this uh, subject. Um, <clears throat> so, well, a, a big motivating idea for Penrose back in the 60s um, uh, was actually sort of very, very modern in uh, many ways. He had a very holographic idea that you shouldn't talk about the points on the inside of a space time because maybe they're all fluctuating but we should talk about things like light cones or light rays that pass through all of space time and make it out to the boundary. Uh, and maybe you could have a theory uh, for things on this interesting boundary involving the, uh, uh, the light rays as fundamental objects and not points in space time. And so <clears throat> that's what we're going to start doing. Uh, we're just gonna start by asking the uh, question, let's say I have a null ray in space time. So, so that's a, uh, how do I characterize a null ray in spacetime? Well, we can be, if we're very basic about this, what is a space of null rays in spacetime? First, how many dimensional it is? It's a five-dimensional space, right? Uh, why is it a five-dimensional space? Well, um, it's laser beams, right? All possible laser beams. So uh, first, I can take my laser pointer and point it in one of two directions on the sky. So that's two directions. And then there's the where the laser point is relative to some origin. That's three numbers. So there's a total of five numbers that specifies in, in four-dimensional space-time the space of all real null rays. It's a five-dimensional space. And since we're complexifying everything, you might think that its naive complexification would be to a five-complex dimensional space, a 10-real-dimensional space. Okay? That's a perfectly good, it's perfectly correct, and it's not interesting for our, for our purposes. You can do that but it hasn't paid off in any interesting way. What twister space is, is a much more interesting complexification of the space of null rays. From five real dimensional to six real dimensional, three complex dimensional, okay? Uh, but we're going to see it, uh, we're, going to, we're, we're going to see it uh, uh, just by following our nose in a very simple way. <clears throat> okay, so let's say I wanna write down a linear equation uh, which is satisfied, I mean, it's a, it's a straight line, it's a line, I wanna write down a linear equation which is satisfied by, by x's, um, and uh, which, which, which are going to lie on a null ray. Well, let's just try to write down a, a linear equation. What are linear equations? They're the form a plus bx equals zero, right? That's if we just have one variable, we'd write down formulas, let me put a minus sign there, okay? a minus bx equals zero. Well, let's just try to write down equations like that, except our x's are going to be x's in space time, okay? And because uh, we're, we're using these nice uh, two by two matrices in order to uh, encode four vectors, let's attempt to write down an equation of exactly the same form. So, so x would have to be some x a a dot. So whatever that it's uh, contracting would have to be something that knows about one of these indices. So let me put a lambda there. And then this is going to be a mu a dot. Okay. So this is a linear equation 
that specifies a bunch of all the x's that satisfy that equation are going to lie on a certain straight line in space time. OK? If I give you a mu and a lambda, so my data here is mu a dot and lambda a is just given data. Okay? And this is going to be some line in space time. Now, I claim it's not a random line. This is a null ray. Why is it a null ray? Well, let me take two points on it. Imagine there's a, some point x1 on this line and x2 on this line. They both satisfy this equation. So I would have mu a dot minus x1 a a dot lambda a equals 0 and mu a dot minus x2 a a dot equals 0. So let me subtract these equations from each other. If I subtract them from each other, I have that x2 minus x1 a a dot lambda a is equal to 0. That means that the matrix x2 minus x1 has a vanishing eigenvector. So that means that the determinant, this means that the determinant of x2 minus x1 is equal to 0. Well, that's exactly that x2 minus x1 squared is equal to 0. So this is a null ray, as I claim. OK? OK, so that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, I've managed to specify a null ray in space time by giving two two dimensional by giving two two dimensional vectors lambda and mu let's think slightly more carefully about it so if I give mu so let me group these lambdas and mu into a big four vector that I'll call z at the moment I'm just grouping them right there's a just random I'm just deciding to group them all together. In a moment, we'll see that the grouping has, has uh, significance. So this capital I runs from 1 to 4. Okay? It's just this four-dimensional vector. But <clears throat> notice that, so if I give you a z, I've specified a null ray. But in fact, if I take this equation and I multiply it by a constant, I'm specifying exactly the same null ray. Right? I haven't changed what the ray is. So that means that it's not z that's in one-to-one -one correspondence with the null ray. It's z identified with any multiple of z. Gives me the same null ray. Okay. So what I really have is a correspondence between four vectors up to rescaling and null rays in space-time. Now, what is the space called, which is just the space of vectors up to overall rescaling? That's just projective space. Okay, you can think of it as just a space of all rays that pass through an origin in four-dimensional space, right? No matter, here's a vector, two times a vector, three times a vector, everything is lining up in this, along the same ray. So the space of all lines that pass through some origin in a four-dimensional space is the projective space P3. So what we have is a correspondence between a point in P3, this is Z, up to Tz, okay? And this corresponds to a null ray in space time. In space time. This P3 is called twister space. And so, as, uh, as Penrose wanted, we have a space now in which the points correspond to null rays in space time. Now, in a minute, we're going to make more of a correspondence between uh, twister space and the space time. But I want to come back now to another one of the important features of, uh, of uh, twister geometry, which is we're dealing with light rays, we're dealing with massless particles. And you all know that theories of massless particles, yes? Yes. Yes, yes, that's right. Nothing, nothing, yeah. I mean, that there's no physical significance to it choosing something to be one. Um, uh, 
That's right, yeah. So, so, so uh, in, in, in a moment, th th there will be a better answer to this question in five minutes, okay? Because, uh, um, because uh, if you think about the answer to that question in ordinary standard projective geometry, we say, indeed, there is no distinction. Uh, but if you want to get an ordinary affine space, uh, let's say Euclidean space, although it's not really Euclidean, it's not a metric. It's just an affine space where I have notions of parallel lines, but not, uh, but not a notion of distance. Then I have to take projected space and also give you information about a line at infinity. Okay? So it's not just a projective space. It's a projective space together with some extra data of the line at infinity. There's an analog of that uh, in Minkowski space. The, there's something called the infinity twister, which is a line in this P3 that as we'll see in a moment, lines in twister space correspond to points in spacetime. And twister space is the conformal compactification of Minkowski space. So if you have conformal symmetry, all patches are equally good. Everything is totally fine. If you break conformal symmetry, then there is a preferred point at infinity. And that is associated with uh, some extra data of a particular line in twister space. Okay? But at the moment, when things are conformally invariant, there is a uh, there's no distinction. Well, that, that's just what I'm about to talk about. Now, you all know that theories of massless particles uh, have, uh, of course, they have dilation invariance, but they also have conformal invariance, at least whenever we have relativistic theories in, in all known examples. Um, and so, and the interesting part of conformal transformations, the meat of conformal symmetry, the, the really surprising part of conformal symmetry, is not the dilations, that's trivial. The, the, the surprising part is inversions. So, uh, so if you, there's a very, so we have conformal symmetry. The big surprise is inversions. And that's a symmetry under which x mu goes to x mu over x squared. <clears throat> And you know, uh, of course, you're all fancy uh, quantum field theorists, so you know all about these things. But you encountered inversions even before uh, when you were in kindergarten or whenever it was in college where you solved this problem of the electric field outside a conducting sphere, right? You've all solved that problem in school. And, and you notice that this problem is solved by this smart method of images, right? You, you find this clever place to put this image charge with some Q prime, okay, such that kind of miraculously, when you work it out, when you put it in the right spot, uh, the, the, the sphere is an uh, uh, equipotential surface. Now, where do you put it if this has radius uh, little r and this distance is capital R? Well, if you remember, you put this thing exactly at little r squared over capital R. Okay, so you put it at the inverted location. And so that's why this method of images trick works is because uh, is because uh, uh, electrostatics has inversions as asymmetry, is a special case of the uh, conformal symmetry. Okay, now, but this is a very surprising symmetry. Okay, it, it relates big and small. It's uh, uh, and and as you know, if you uh, if you do a translation, uh, if you do an inversion, a translation, an inversion back, then you get the infinitesimal version of the conformal symmetry, which are the special conformal transformations. Uh, I mean, that's already just a little comment. Um, I won't, I'll just take another five, five minutes here uh, before ending. Just, just a little comment is it might have bugged you a little that we have this big conformal symmetry, even before we get into conformal symmetry, even when we just talk about Poincaré symmetry, it might have bothered you that, that space-time symmetries, in the usual way of thinking about how they act on space-time, they all look rather different. We have translations which are DDX, roughly. We have uh, rotations, Lorentz, which are X DDX. And we have special conformal, which is X X DDX. Right. And yet, of course, they all form just one big algebra. None of the generators are special relative to any of the other ones. And yet, by demanding that they act on local spacetime coordinates in the standard way, uh, we're sort of obscuring the basic similarity between all of them, okay? <clears throat> so now, so let's keep that in mind. And now instead of asking, how do those symmetries act on points in space-time, let's ask, how do those symmetries act on light rays? 
And that's, that has a beautiful answer, that acting on light rays, these symmetries are treated on a completely equal footing. And the action of all of those symmetries, all of the conformal transformations, are nothing other than four by four linear transformations on these, uh, on these twister variables. So let's see, let's see why that is, and I'll uh, end with that before picking things up again tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> so to begin with, let's imagine that we have two points in space-time, x1 and x, uh, x and y. And of course, the distance between them, x minus y squared, under inversions, um, well, it's, of course, it's not, even, it's not even variant under dilations, and it's also not invariant under inversions. Under inversions, this goes to x minus y squared over x squared, y squared, under inversions. However, what you'll uh, clearly notice is that if x minus y squared equals 0, then this goes to 0 under inversions. So having two points null separated is a conformally invariant notion. <clears throat> the distance isn't conformally invariant, but if they're null separated, that is a conformally invariant notion. <clears throat> OK. And so we can then ask how the, uh, since the light rays are now associated with these mu's and lambdas, we can ask uh, how, these, how the symmetries act on the mu's and the lambdas. So, so let's see. Uh, how do Lorentz transformations act on lambda and mu? Well, this is obvious, OK? It just their act as an SL2, as an SL2 cross SL2. So Lorentz transformations are SL2 cross SL2. What about translations? Well, if I take x goes to x plus delta, then I just have exactly the same formula, but my mu is shifted. Mu a dot goes to mu a dot plus delta a a dot lambda a. Okay? So that's the action of, that's the action of translations. So, so you see, Lorentz is mu goes to L mu, lambda goes to L prime lambda. That's a linear transformation on mu and lambda. Lorentz trans uh, translations are a linear transformation on mu and lambda. Just mu goes to mu plus something times lambda. Finally, what about inversions? Well, if you just take this equation and we divide by x squared, then, then, then we find that lambda is equal to lambda minus x over x squared, mu is equal to 0. So inversions is just lambda swapped with mu. Also, a linear transformation on mu and lambda. So that's the beautiful thing, that when we group the lambdas and the mu's together into this big four vector z, and now this four vector has a point, a reason to be called a four vector, is that the conformal transformations just act as z goes to some big L z, where L is in SL4. Those are the complexified conformal transformations. Okay? And so, and who are, so again, in this big 4x4 four four matrix, there is an SL2 for Lorentz here, there's an SL2 for Lorentz here. This guy up there is the translations, oh, I guess, this guy down here are the translations, and these guys up here are the special conformal transformations. Okay? But everything is treated on a beautifully equal footing. So, the, a final thing I'll say uh, quickly before ending is just to finish this basic correspondence between uh, between 
uh, twister space and space time. Uh, so we saw that a point, so here's this P3 of twister space, ST. Here's a point Z in P3. And this is associated with a null ray in space time, ST, null ray. Okay. Now, now let's say that we take here two points in twister space. So let's say a point Z1 and a, or ZA and a point ZB. Okay. Well, this is associated with some null ray. That's associated with some other null ray. And it's not so trivial to, uh, to visualize, um, but we'll see it in equations in a moment. Those two null rays intersect at a point. Why do they intersect at a point? Well, uh, let's look at all the x's that sit on the, the line ZA. Well, they're all the form. There's some, there's some mu for A. I'm suppressing the indices now. Minus x lambda for A is equal to 0. And then let's ask, is there a mu for b minus the same x? Is there a, some x common to both lines, lambda b equals 0? Can I solve these equations? And of course, I can, because this is two equations. That's two equations, four linear equations in total for four unknowns, the four x's. Okay? So there's four equations and four unknowns, and so I can solve for all the x's. And this is a tiny exercise I'll leave for you. You can solve the x, a, a dot, is... Apologies for the mixed notation here, but it's mu a lambda b minus mu b lambda a over lambda a lambda b. Okay, so given two points in twister space, there is a point x a b associated with them in space time. All right, but just like before, there, this is actually very redundant. Before, we could multiply our equation by any constant, and we got the same null ray. Now we can do much more. We can take any linear combination of these two equations. Any linear combination of these two equations will give me exactly the same point x. So that means that I can take any linear combination of a and b, of z a and z b, and they will give me exactly the same point x. Now, what is that space, which is all possible linear combinations of A and B? What is that geometrically? Well, if you think about that space in, a, in the four-dimensional space in which the Zs live, what are all the possible combinations of two directions, Z A and Z B? It's a two-dimensional two plane. Right? There's a two-dimensional plane that passes through the origin that contains Z A and Z B. Right? So in this four-dimensional space of Zs, there's a two-plane in four dimensions. Right? And now, what happens when I look at this projectively? Okay? Um, this looks like a line in the projective space. Okay? So a line in this P3, a line in P3 corresponds to a point in space-time. Okay? And so that's the most basic twistorial connection, is that points in twister space correspond to null rays in space-time, Lines in twister space correspond to points in space-time. Now, what is the beauty of all of this? The beauty of all this is that when we think in twister space, all the symmetries have turned into SL4, especially when we're doing everything in a complexified way. All the symmetries have turned into SL4, and it's just projective geometry. There's no notion of distance. There's no metric. There's nothing fancy or complicated. We just have 4 by 4 linear transformations. The only invariant symbol we have is the epsilon symbol. And geometrically, we, we can never talk about the distance between points or anything like that. The only things that we can talk about are, for example, any two points are on a line. Maybe you can have three points. In general, they won't be on a line. But sometimes they might be on a straight line together. <laughs> or if I take one line and another line, in general, they won't cross. Maybe they can cross each other. Okay? But it's, so there's, there's nothing about a distance or anything else. right? Just these uh, simple questions of incidence, whether, whether points and lines and planes pass through, intersect through each other or not. In particular, uh, and, this, and this we'll pick up uh, uh, next time, but I just want to uh, leave it for you as something to uh, play with. Um, 
So all of Minkowski geometry, all of conformal geometry reduces to just thinking about planes and points and things like that in the three-dimensional projective space. And, and thinking visually about geometry in projective three-dimensional uh, projective space is exactly like standard geometry. So when you say a line in P3, you just think of it as just the line in a three-dimensional space. And you'll never get anything wrong when you think like that, OK? Um, we'll have a little lightning review of projective geometry next time. Um, but uh, but it's, there's, no, there's nothing, it's completely familiar uh, geometry. Um, uh, the only novelty is that every, all lines intersect. They, they might intersect at infinity, but all lines intersect. That's the only small novelty. This was worked out by people in the 1500s, so it can't be very difficult. Okay, so, um, but, but the beauty of it is that you don't have to keep track of metrics. You don't have to think about light cones. You, know, you just think about lines and how they intersect each other. So uh, just to give uh, a, a concrete example, if you have two points in space-time now, you can ask, take these two points, what is the distance between them? In general, it's not conformally invariant. But if the two points are null separated, what does that mean back in twister space? So now, now I'm back in space-time. I have a point here, x, x1. I have some other point, x2. And let's say that they are null separated. What could that possibly mean? Well, let's think in twister space. What could it mean? Well, x1 corresponds to some line. Here's, here's the line that corresponds to 1. And x2 corresponds to, to some other line. Now, what could it possibly mean that they're null separated? The lines intersect. That's all. Okay. In general, two lines in three-dimensional space will not intersect. But if they intersect, it means that the corresponding points are not separated. Furthermore, what is the interpretation of this intersection point? That is now a point in twister space. So who is that point in twister space? What should it correspond to? It corresponds to a null ray. Which null ray does it correspond to? That null ray, right? The one that passes through x1 and x2, right? So this will be the basis of... Uh, are beginning our story next time uh, to come up with the most ideal set of variables to describe the scattering uh, uh, process. Um, but for now, I just want to see that this question of whether things are light-like separated gets turned into little geometry questions about whether lines in intersect. And I want to leave you with this homework assignment um, to try to solve the following geometry problem in complexified Minkowski space. Okay. Let's say you're given four points. You have four radio stations, right? You're given four points in Minkowski space, so different space, time. And they want to send signals out. Uh, and to be all four of them not separated from the some fifth point. So, so you want to, they're all, they're all sending signals out. And you want to be somewhere which can receive signals light signals from all four of those points simultaneously, OK? So that's the geometry question. Given four points in Minkowski space, given four points in space time, can you find a fifth point which is null separated from all four? Okay. That sounds like a typical egghead nerd math problem, <laughs> OK? Um, but uh, actually, it shows up very concretely in th this kind of problem, and big generalizations of it show up very concretely in, in, in scattering amplitude calculations. But anyway, you can spend a little bit of time thinking about that just in straight Minkowski space. It's not that hard in straight Minkowski space either. But you have to visualize a little bit like cone spheres, uh, things, things like that. I want you to translate that problem into twister space and try to solve it in twister space. So first, can you find any such points? How many of them are there? And so on. If you're super dumb, you might think that you're solving four quadratic equations, right? You have x5 minus x1 squared equals 0, x5 minus x2 squared. So if you're super dumb, you might think, well, you're solving four couple quadratic equations. Maybe there's two to the four solutions. There's 16 solutions or something like that, OK? Well, that's a little too dumb. There's actually two solutions. There's precisely two solutions in general. But I, I want you to see if you can understand what the, where those two solutions come from from this language. And in this language, it turns into a very different seeming problem. Given each point in Minkowski space turns into a line in space time. So now the question is, I'm, I give you four lines, sorry, four lines in uh, twister space. I give you four lines in three space. Dink, 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 dink. So four 
general lines, can you find a fifth line that intersects all four? Okay. Now that question is the classic very first question that started the subject of algebraic geometry in the mid-1800s in the hands of Mr. Schubert. And it's the first, of, the first classic question, if you take any undergraduate course in algebraic geometry, you'll run into this very, very early on. It's the most basic problem in the Schubert calculus. But in this case, it's really extremely simple, and you can visualize it and see what the answer is. Okay? And, um, and if you want to think about it, I, I, I encourage you to take this picture and specialize the lines a little bit. Don't keep them totally uh, skew. You can specialize, for example, to the case where two of the lines intersect, and another two of the lines intersect in some other way. And in those more special situations, you can count to see how many solutions there are, what they look like, and uh, see if you can see why the answer is two. Uh, what's nice is you see not only that the answer is two, but precisely what those points are, because you sort of build, build the line and you get some very nice uh, intuition for it. All right, so that's your little twistorial exercise. And uh, tomorrow, we'll, um, uh, uh, we'll pick uh, the story back up and finish describing the kinematics before moving to projective geometry and the uh, positive geometry of the amplitude. Thanks a lot.